Our gracious God, we continue to be thankful for who you are, thankful that week by week you carry us along by your spirit, Lord, and we arrive at another Lord's Day, another day to come and learn, another day to come and worship, another day, Lord, to come and celebrate our risen Savior. Lord, we praise you, we thank you in Christ's name. Give me one second. Yeah. All right, so for this morning's Sunday School, we're actually going to begin by talking about a new book that's called A Christian Manifesto. A Christian Manifesto. I would have brought the book, but uh, Chris was supposed to be here, and he was supposed to bring the book so I could display it. But basically, A Christian Manifesto is a book written by Francis Schaeffer. Francis Schaeffer, um, you know, he was a philosopher. He was uh, very big on cultural commentary, on being involved in the world, and he was honestly, in many ways, feared by the left. He was feared by those who were outside the realm of Christianity and didn't want to see Christianity to be um, the worldview of the people. And Francis Schaeffer was, in many ways, leading the way for what was to come in our day. If you go back and read his book from the 70s, you, and you go back and, and listen to his his talks from when he was first talking about the dangers that were lying ahead with secular humanism, it almost sounds as if he was living today, because of how accurate he was in predicting the outcome of the secular humanistic worldview. So this book, A Christian Manifesto, is in response to the human manifesto, which essentially was talking about how they thought would be the best way for society to, to govern itself, for culture to advance, and things of that nature. And this book was written directly in opposition to that, even in opposition to the Communist Manifesto as well. Francis Schaeffer being someone who obviously was a commenting on, on, on culture and talking about how the Christians need to influence society with their worldview. He saw, well, we need a manifesto. We need to have something that we have written out that shows what we Christians believe and how we implement what we believe. So this first chapter that I'm going to be going through is called The Abolition of Truth and Morality. I mean, I would think we all would say in in our day that there's no such thing as truth in the left and the world anymore. Everything's relativism. Everything is truth based on experience, truth on what sounds right to you, or truth on just pure absurdity. And for certainty, there's no morality in our culture any longer. What, what happened, right? If you look at the history of the United States, all the gospel's impl- impact, all, the, all the, the, the societal benefits that we were having from a Christian worldview, what happened? Well, there was a change of worldview. A change. What's a worldview? Uh, literally, it's just a way that you view the world. That's what a worldview is. And when it comes down to it, the foundational aspects of, of, of worldviews, there's only two worldviews. Either you begin with God or you begin with man. Either you begin to flesh all things out through the person of God and what he has said, or you start with man and his reason and his and his philosophies, that which begins by chance, and man decides truth. So in the 60s and the 70s, you know, this is something that's been happening before then, but of course, in those years, there was a cultural revolution, people were standing up against Western thought and Christian thought, and even to, in, in our day, you see a lot of Marxist group explicitly saying Christianity is what's wrong with the West. Objective Truth is what's wrong with the West. In fact, they say objective truth is white supremacy. I don't know how they can equate those things, but you see that there's an, there's an outflow to worldviews. Worldviews aren't just done in a vat. Everyone in this room has a worldview when you answer your question about anything in regards to our world. So, Francis Schaeffer knew it begins with worldview. There was a time when culture had a general Christian worldview, even though not everyone was a Christian. There was a time when divorce was still wrong, even though not everyone said that it's wrong because of the scriptures. There was a time when abortion was frowned upon, even by some in the left. But what happened? Well, one, the anti-Christian groups became militant. They began to infiltrate the schools. They began to infiltrate the government. They began to infiltrate the universities. Meanwhile, Christians began to pull back. And Christians began to preach what's called pietism. 
Now, I want everyone to be pious. I want everyone to have a reverence for God, live their lives holy under God. Amen. But there became a, a storm of what we would call Platonic pietism, right? Coming from Plato, which basically said, this world is bad. These things of this world are evil. Christians don't belong in this world. Christians are going to go to heaven. This is just a temporary state for us. And they began to be, essentially become what I would say functional monks. Though they were living in society, they would kind of try to, as much as they can, go to their little uh, uh, you know, monasteries and, and begin to avoid the bad things of this world. And Christians said, okay, in the areas of Bible study, in the areas of Sunday school and, and Sunday worship and, and things that happen on Sunday, Christian things, prayer, right? These things, these things are Christian things. But the way we do politics, the way we go to work, the way we raise our children, that's a different sphere. So Christians in their mind began to break up their worldview into two spheres, sacred, secular. The sacred is that which we do for Christianity. The secular is the other things, the worldly things, as you could call them. So you have the left pushing their agenda, being active, being militant, being all in, and you had Christians pulling back. Well, let's get out of the culture wars. Let's stop promoting any type of semblance of Christianity. We don't want to offend anyone in culture. Let's just stick to the, 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 the essentials, as it were. Not seeing that Christianity is a total view of the world. Not just a religious view of things. A total view of all things. So it became material versus physical. Spiritual versus temporal. The false view was, this world doesn't matter. And the correct view is, Christianity touches every sphere of life. What we would call transformational kyperianism. A fancy word that just means, you see anywhere in this world, if it's done for Christ, it can be done to his honor, because he is truly Lord of it all. I know we talk about this a lot. I know I preach this constantly here. But it's because I just see it so prevalent in society that we begin to just have these little false divisions in our worldview and I see the things that belong to the Lord. Like, okay, I'm going to do these for him. I'm going to do these for them. But the way that I talk to my coworkers, well, that, 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 that's fine. You know, I could do it as a Christian, but I don't need to be explicitly Christian about it. No, we need to take the Lordship of Christ and apply it to every single area of life. And that's what Schaefer is getting at in this first chapter. The, ab- the abolition of truth and morality. Why has there been an abolition of truth and morality? Because Christians stopped applying the Lordship of Christ to every single area of life. And this is the main reality here. Once Christians stopped doing that, and they made Christianity a thing about personal individualism, or my private prayer life, and Sunday, and Bible time only, it began to become the downfall of Christianity, and by extension, of the culture. Schaefer used to say, on every abortion clinic, there should be a sign that reads, open because of the church. Because the church did not rise up. Because the church saw that as a private matter between mother and doctor. It's not, it's not a, a church stance we're going to take. How many times have you heard that in your life? Our church won't take a stance. Our church won't take a stance. No, the church should take stance. Where Christ is Lord, the church should proclaim Christ is Lord and take a stand. Schaefer knew it. Schaefer would say things like this, Christianity is not just true. It is true, but it's not just true. Christianity is the truth. And nothing can be known about the world, about morality, about good, about bad, about evil. Nothing can be known about anything apart from Christianity. And people started saying, oh, you Christians are selfish with the truth. You, you, you guys think you guys have a corner on the truth and everyone should listen to you guys? And we would say, no, we don't have a corner on the truth. But Christ does. Because he is the truth. You see, when Christians began to give over to the thought that there's a realm in our life that's not the lordship of Christ, we began to allow secular humanism to come in. This which came, remember there was a reformation that basically said the glory of God extends and the glory of God should go out and we hold everything under the scriptures, then the enlightenment came. What was the enlightenment? Oh, human reason is the best thing. We humans are the best. I'm a reasonable man. If you know that phrase, it's an old philosopher phrase that Mr. Bill Nye would often say in his little uh, debates against Ken Ham. Well, a reasonable man, a reasonable man. That's enlightenment thought. And while many good things came out of the enlightenment, really, it became a shift to subtle humanism, 
Man is the center. Man is autonomous. Man is the arbiter of truth. Man dictates what's good and bad. Man, man, man. And they stopped asking, what does Christianity think? What does Christ think? What does the Lordship of Christ apply in this area? How does it apply in this area? So, not only in areas of faith does Christianity apply, but Christianity has an answer and the basis and the foundation for government, politics, laws, abortion, morality, social justice, and it's how unbiblical it is. And we have a view of biblical justice. We don't just have an alternative. That's what Christians think. Oh, look, we have a better alternative. We have a more free alternative. That's true. But ours is the only true alternative. And until we begin to think in those terms, yeah, we might sound a little bit off-putting, but the reality is, is that there's no neutrality in this world. They're not saying that, well, okay, we'll consider your alternative. No, they're saying ours is the truth. And they're pushing it like they live it. And most secular humanists are truly priests for Satan. They advance his cause. And now we Christians need to be priests for our Lord and advance his cause. And not just give a, have you considered this? No, but to say, no, because of Christ, because of his word, we declare these things to be wrong. Because our king has said it to be so. We know what's needed for human flourishing. Christians should be the most humanitarian, the most humanistic, in the truest sense of the word, because we know what's best for man. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the Lord ruling and reigning in the hearts of his people. And where the gospel goes, listen church, where the gospel goes, there's always been, been a benefit to that society. You start with man, and, and what happens? Chaos. Disorder. You go to where the gospel hasn't been, just look at the streets. Literally, the car is driving around with no order. Cars barely missing each other. I know it sounds so simplistic, but the reason people still stop at stop signs at 2 a.m. when there's no car around in America is because of the gospel's impact on our, on our, on our country. We have a sense of law and order, and we're losing it because Christians are pulling out of this fight. The systems that we've enjoyed in our country is those systems that have come about by the gospel and the Christian worldview and the impact it has had on our country, form, order, and freedom. We just assume those are the case. You know, I grew up in this country. I grew up from uh, parents who came from Mexico, and I never understood why this country was called the land of the free. I never understood why it was called, you know, we have, we have the most freedom. We're, we're liberty-loving people. And so I became an adult and saw people trying to strip our liberties. And I just had assumed that the whole world enjoyed freedom. I assumed that the whole world was benefiting of free freedom form, sorry, form freedom and form order, and assumed that it was just the, the natural dis disposition of people. But no, you start studying world history. You start seeing cultures around the world and you realize where the gospel of Christ has not had an influence, chaos, totalitarianism, tyranny, disorder, and where Christ goes and his spirit is felt, and the gospel is cherished. Order, freedom, liberty. So it's no wonder why as Christianity is losing its voice in society, to tyranny is beginning to get a bigger voice. The church is pulling out, the tyrants are pulling in. The Christian manifesto is this, dear church. We need to return to God's laws. We need to return to God's freedom that will bring about the most true liberty-loving society all under the bad banner of the Lordship of Christ and of His gospel, dear church. Our little church, I pray, will truly be the voice on the, on the mountaintops, the voice on the roof saying, we need to return all to the Lordship of Christ and stop dividing Christianity to a private thing. Now, Christianity infiltrates all of life, dear church. Every single sphere of it. May we be a church that truly reflects that. That's chapter one of the abolition of truth and morality in society. The Christians pulled out, the secular humanists went all in, and they infiltrated their doctrine in every area they could, from the grade schools to the universities, to media, to television, to Hollywood. Every single area is touched by secular humanists. May you all Christians just stand by and enjoy entertainment. May we rise up to your church. Any questions? Anyone want to enlist for the army? No, just <laughs> let's go. Let's go ahead and pray.
Our gracious God, please allow us, Lord, in all humility and all honor, Lord, not becoming prideful or arrogant. Allow us, Lord, by the gospel and the, and the lordship of Christ to truly be a people who take his word and the Christian worldview and apply it to every single sphere and area of life. For Christ is Lord, Christ is King, and he must prevail, and the nations will bow down to him. Help us, O Lord, prepare our hearts for worship. In Christ's name, amen.